Welcome to Talking Success, the podcast series that focuses on everything fintech. I'm your host, Darren Franks, and each week I'll be joined by a series of experts in the field who have a wealth of knowledge to share. It's time to meet this week's guest, so grab a coffee and let's start Talking Success. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Talking Success. Um, for our regular listeners and viewers, uh, you'll probably realize my background's slightly different. Well, I'm, I'm on location. I'm in, uh, I'm in Durban, my first, first time in Durban, uh, which is fantastic. If you're in South Africa, I'd highly recommend a trip down to the coast. It's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic place with uh, great curries, uh, as well as other things. So uh, I'm on location. Um, I'm super, super excited um, to have Kun with me today. Uh, Kun Yonker, who's the CEO and founder of Time Bank, who I'm sure doesn't need much of an introduction, um, but we will get one nonetheless. Um, I've got a load of questions for Kun today, and I'm going to start off before he introduces himself, um, saying, well, I looked at your profile, Kun, right? We've not met before. We've, we've had a couple of conversations in the past. Um, when, I, when I typically look at sort of fintech or banking, digital banking entrepreneurs, they either come from the world of tech, so they're techies, or they're bankers. Um, I don't think you're either of those, right? I think you came from a different route. Um, I want to delve into that a little bit as well. But um, for everyone that doesn't know you and hasn't heard of Time Bank, where they've been living under a rock for the last five years, um, perhaps you could give us a, a very quick intro, uh, who you are, who Time Bank is, and then we can get into the uh, your, your background, your very interesting background. Darren, thank you so much for, for having me. Look forward to our conversation. Um, yeah, so Time is a multi-country digital banking group. We actually headquartered in Singapore. Uh, Time Bank is our flag flagship operation in South Africa. Uh, we're four years old. Uh, we have now have seven and a half million customers in South Africa. So roughly right. one in six people in South Africa who can have a bank account have a Time Bank account. Our passion is uh, democratization of access to banking focused on consumers and, and small businesses. Uh, we've also now launched our second bank, uh, which is GoTime Bank in the Philippines. And uh, we're close to our first million customers in the Philippines. Uh, oh, so that's, 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 the, that's the short version of the story. All right, fantastic. So how, how does a, a non-banker and a non-techie get into the, the world of banking? Well, sorry, digital banking. Yeah, Darren, yeah, my, my background is in law. I actually started yeah. my life as a human rights lawyer in the early wow. 90s. And uh, my, you know, at the time, my passion was sort of, uh, you know, human rights and, and, and equality and creating a fairer and a more democratic South Africa. Uh, and then we, uh, as we all know, we, we want political freedom and emancipation for all South Africans. And I thought, well, you know, I'm done with that. I'm going to become an M&A lawyer, which I did. Uh, ended up um, being the managing partner of a firm called Edward Nathan, uh, mm -hmm. now Edward Nathan Sonnenbergs. I ran the law firm for five years. Uh, but at that time, it became more and more apparent to me that um, political freedom does not uh, necessarily translate to economic uh, empowerment and that there's a big job to be done in economic empowerment. So I started getting really interested in this, in this whole concept, this whole area of financial inclusion, uh, economic agency, uh, and the role that the private sector and banks can play in empowering people in their financial lives. So, so that was first an academic interest, then I started teaching it, and at some point I decided to make a career change. Uh, and it's sort of through this um, financial inclusion route that I actually became interested in digital banking uh, as a means to an end, as what seemed to be the most sensible way uh, to, to drive real democratization of finance. It, it's very interesting. I, I was at a, an event um, a couple of weeks ago in Cairo, um, a, a banking event, and we were asked, I was wearing my fintech association hat, and I was asked to talk about um, the fintech landscape here in South Africa. And I think we're we, and I, I say that we because I've, I've been in South Africa many years, um, are very proud of the fact that 80% you know, of the population is banked, right? But I think it's very underbanked. Um, clearly, time has had a, a big influence in that number, clearly. Um, 
But there's a long way to go. Uh, you know, getting people utilizing bank accounts, digital bank accounts. And as, as Gita was saying from, from Parza, um, the, the challenge is, yes, they have a bank account. People have a bank account. But it's not only is it very transactional, but it's salary goes in and then cash gets withdrawn. Um, so actually keeping, that, keeping the, um, the, the funds and the liquidity within the system digitally is actually quite a big challenge. And um, given the number of the products that Time Bank is certainly offering here in South Africa, we'll come on to the international side a bit later on, but the products you're offering here, the buy now, pay later, obviously the SME banking side, um, you know, all of these things are designed, if I'm not mistaken, to, to try and keep the um, the digital economy um, at a level that is sustainable. Is it, have, I, have I read that right? Do I understand that correctly? No, you're absolutely spot on. So, <clears throat> you know, the way um, we think about, let's call it transaction banking and savings. So when somebody starts using their phone and their debit or their credit card to start transacting rather than cash, mm. um, that is really just the means to an end. Um, the, the, the key to real uh, democratization of finance is actually data. Um, the, the, you know, the idea that when I have a bank account, I'm financially included or I'm financially empowered, I, I think is only like a small part of the story. It's not yeah. untrue, but it's not the whole story. The whole story is that we only really develop economic agency uh, in our lives, in our families' lives, and for our businesses, when we have access to capital. And what we mean by access to capital is we can take the assets we have, including our future cash flows, and we can use that to get the cash we need to reinvest in our lives, in our families' lives, in our business, to grow our business. And so the end game is always access to capital. The uh -huh. starting point often is transactions. And the reason for that is, um, is only when you transact digitally that I can get to know you, that you come out of the, the, the darkness of the cash world where, 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 the, where the formal economy is really blind to you. Um, you come into the light of, of, of digital data and we can actually engage with you and we can fund your business or we can lend you money for consumer goods or to build a house or to put your children through university, and so on and so on. So the thing that you said there about underbanked is exactly right. Um, and this is not just true for, for, for very poor people. I think people uh, in many parts of the economy, uh, particularly business people, are chronically underbanked and chronically undercapitalized for what mm. they need to really reach their full potential. And there's obviously a lot of challenges, um, but opportunities when having a digital bank. When you look at some of the incumbent banks and the products that they're offering, um, how does it compare? I mean, I know at the interest rate level in terms of saving, um, there really is no comparison. I've not seen an account that offers sort of 11% um, savings as, as Time Bank does. But on, on the other products and services, um, specifically, if we're talking, you mentioned sort of home improvement uh, and you mentioned education for, for children. Um, when it comes to bonds here or mortgages here in, in South Africa, I, I feel that that's an area of the financial services that hasn't really been disrupted. Uh, it, it, it's quite um, op opaque, um, I think probably is the, is the best word. It, it is what it is, and there hasn't been much um, innovation around that. Do, do you see Time Bank, uh, or do you see there uh, there's room for disruption in, in that specific area? Uh, Darren, uh, yes, absolutely. You, you know, I think um, this 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 journey of digitizing finance um, mm. is a many multi, it's a multi-year journey. Um, and I think that we only sort of five or 10% into the potential of what uh, can still be disrupted and digitized in this market. And for mm. me, to some extent, um, home loans and vehicle and asset finance represents the furthest end of that evolution. So we're not there starting back today. Um, yep partly because of how the system operates, uh, partly of how, on how difficult and expensive it is to develop those solutions. But, but I believe that the end game for South Africa uh, is that somebody can buy and sell property significantly faster 
and cheaper and safer than they can today. And that mm. probably requires us uh, to take the deeds office onto the blockchain uh, and to develop, uh, to take the technology that's already out there and that's becoming more and more accepted uh, and to use that as a platform to create a digital transformation in the way we see property, property rights, and the way that's actually tokenized and represented in the digital world. But, but we're certainly not there yet, and I think whoever gets it right, there's a big opportunity there. And as you said, that's kind of the, the, the sort of the end road, right, or the end goal, and that's really sort of a bit further down the line. Um, when we look at uh, something that's kind of here and now, um, and let's talk about the growth of, of Time Back and the six million customers that, that you've acquired. Um, you know, for, for those who don't know Time Bank, maybe we've got some people from overseas that, that are looking at this. The, the route to market and, and the customer acquisition strategy was really, or is really, really unique. Um, this is a blend of digital plus in person, but without branches. Um, and I'll, I'll let you unravel the, the rest, other because it's your story, and I'm just sort of taking it and sort of probably not describing it in the best way. But um, in terms of that acquisition strategy, which I think was absolutely phenomenal, do you, you can give our listeners a bit of an insight as to what that was, why that was um, deployed, and how successful it's been. Yeah, uh, actually, you did quite a good job there, Darren. So so the way, the way we think about it is that, you know, the, the phone is, the, is, is a great tool to engage in financial services. But for many people, the process of opening a bank account or, or, or buying funeral policy or, or getting a loan is quite an intimidating process. Mm. And, um, and going straight from living in the cash world to, to using my phone to open a bank account is quite hard for a lot of people. And so what we've seen um, as a pattern globally is that what I would call pure play digital banks have, have attracted a very particular profile of customer. They've sort of sure. attracted the sort of digitally native, tech savvy um, kind of customers, uh, very heavy early adopters and wealthier customers. Now, when we started Time Bank, our ambition was very clearly not to build a niche bank. Our ambition was to build a mass market bank for all South Africans that would that would um, that would make it possible for anyone to have a bank account and use a bank account and empower people. And so what we did is we created two new channels. We created what we call the kiosk. So that mm -hmm. is a sort of a stand-up kiosk, looks like an ATM, but it's actually just a sales and service channel where you can open a bank account in about three and a half minutes. The bank account is immediately live. It it prints you a debit card and you walk away with a live debit card after three and a half minutes. Um, and it does also, you can reset your PIN, you can replace your card, you can do other things, you can buy a funeral policy and so on at that kiosk. And what we then did is we, we employed um, young people from the local communities in which we operate to essentially um, be there next to the kiosk. Uh, as, um, as, as brand ambassadors, and their only job was to get you comfortable with the technology and to explain to you how the product works and get you comfortable with our products. Um, and then the other channel that we created was a cash deposit and withdrawal channel at the checkout counter in the retail store. So, so if you're the kind of person who, where even an uh, ATM is a bit intimidating for you, you could actually just go to the checkout counter and the person working there at the checkout counter will help you deposit and withdraw cash into your account. And those right. channels have been hugely successful for us. You know, we've got about 80% of our 7.5 million customers have actually come through that channel. Although you can sign up to a time bank account just using your phone or using your PC or your tablet. Um, so 80% of our customers have come through that channel. And now if we, if we look at South Africa and the Philippines, we are now growing at around a million customers every three months. And 80% wow. of them are still coming through that channel. Amazing. I, I want to delve into the Philippines in, in a moment. I've just got a couple of questions, if I may. Um, was, there, was there a need for regulatory change in order to um, – allow consumers to be able to open up a bank account without a wet signature um, and without having to provide any 
sort of document. So was there work that was done behind the scenes with um, uh, the, the, the Baza and uh, the various different sort of associations and uh, Saab here in South Africa and FCA? Darren, yes, that's, that's uh, I guess, where uh, being a lawyer became a little bit useful in this world. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we, um, we think about the relationship with the regulator very much as a partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's an there's a old saying in law that the law follows a respectful distance behind technology. And uh, what we can't afford in our business is for that respectful distance to be too far. So, so we've spent over the years a lot of time working with regulators here and elsewhere in the world to convince them to allow new things to happen. And one of them was the way in which we open accounts. And we're very lucky in South Africa, we have a very progressive um, and open-minded regulator who, who was keen to not only build a banking system that is safe, but one that is accessible for everyone. Um, but, we, but, but we actually, with the South African regulator, we actually ended up trailblazing in a few areas. The, the, the one was actually building a bank in the cloud. So Time Bank has run end-to-end on AWS cloud. Um, and we were the first bank, certainly the first in Africa. We think possibly, uh, you know, one of the first three banks in the world to run a bank uh, in the cloud. And that required regulatory change. It required a lot of education, probably about a year of hard work um, to, 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 to make that change. And then, although the regulations were quite good around account opening, um, and South Africa particularly, um, actually by the time we launched, didn't require wet signatures, there were changes and evolution required uh, and, and collaboration required. Um, and so my, you know, I always say to, 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 to any fintech entrepreneur, um, you, have, you cannot see the regulator as your enemy. And no. I personally don't like a strategy to try and get around the regulator. Um, you absolutely have to build that partnership and that mutual respect if you want to build a sustainable business. No, I completely agree. Um, and then there's another bit of innovation as well before we come on to the international side. Um, and I wasn't aware of this until I did my research prior to this call. Um, but you have a soft pause um, solution as well for your merchants, um, which I've been harping on about for the last last year and a half going, I, I don't understand the sort of the, the physical pause market. I think it's kind of, it's had its time. Um, why would, sorry, no pun intended. Um, I, I don't know why you would need a physical device if I've got an Android or I've got a Huawei phone or an iOS phone and I can take payments, especially as a small a micro merchant. I understand for a big retailer, they're going to need something a little bit more um, sort of robust or a little bit more complex. Um, but how's the uptake been on, on soft pods within your sort of SME market? Yeah, you know, you know uh, firstly, I think that that's right. That form factor is less and less important. You know, there's this, uh, was it Horowitz who said, uh, software is eating the world. You don't no longer need hardware modules. You can have software modules, download the, the app on your phone and use it. Uh, and it's a great solution. Um, we've seen good uptake. I would say not as fast as we would like, but I think, I don't think that's a demand issue. I don't think our product is as good as we'd like it to be. Um, uh, uh, and so I think that there's no doubt that the world is going in that direction where less and less uh, people will require a standalone device uh, mm. to, do, to take payments. But then there's an interesting new thing coming um, that we've seen working very well in other markets, and that is on the back of uh, PayShop, the rapid payment mm. protocol that we've implemented in South Africa is the ability to use a QR code as a form factor for payment. Uh, And uh, I think the interesting next step, so whereas a soft pause or a software pause on the phone potentially replaces an old-school point-of-sale machine, um, the next step is potentially uh, any one of us can simply print a QR code, slap it on the front of our shop, and anyone who has a bank account can simply take, you know, scan the QR code and pay us to use QR code. And now you're in a world where actually the card rails are no longer even in play when yeah. you are making payments, micro payments uh, in, um, in communities, in the informal sector and so on. 
I thought what was interesting, again, when I was doing my research, was um, peer-to-peer payments um, in terms of uh, time bank customer to time bank customer is free of charge. There's no charge to do that. Um, Do do, do you see a play for time bank to integrate with PayShap like some of the other banks have done um, or or, or not? Um, So uh, Darren, without giving too much away around our strategy, let me say let me say this: um, we have we have seen the power of free or near free real time peer to peer payments in mm. markets like India, the Philippines, Vietnam, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and other markets. And we think that it's 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 unstoppable. At some point, we will have free or near free peer to peer digital payments. Uh, and then by the time we get there, the, 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 the thing that gets disrupted is not card payments. The thing that gets disrupted is cash because suddenly it becomes as, as easy and as cheap to move money digitally as it is in people's perception to move money taking cash out of their, uh, out of their wallets. And, and, and to That's my right. mind, the question is not whether we get there. It's simply how fast right. do we get there. Uh, and who's going to lead it? I, I, again, I think when we're looking at sort of the financial inclusion side, you know, for me to give you five rand out of my wallet cost me five rand. For me to give you five rand out of my bank account, as it is at the moment, it might cost me six rand fifty or six rand, or whatever it, or whatever the prices are set by by the banks. Um, that doesn't incentivize me, who's you know lower LSM, to to move digitally because it's going to cost me more money. Um, so uh, I think you're right. If we, if we can, I know it's a bit of a race to the bottom in terms of you know margins and slices and dices for for schemes and what have you. But I think it's inevitable. Uh, we, we won't talk about cross border payments. That's probably one for another day. But let, let's talk on to the internationalization side um, now. The majority of fintechs or, um, yeah, okay, the majority of fintechs here in South Africa or in Africa, when they look at expanding, they typically look at neighboring countries, right? Or they look at, you know, the big four. They look at Ghana, they look at Nigeria, they look at Kenya, they look at South Africa. Um, Now, time banks in Philippines, soon to be Pakistan, um, how did that come about? What, 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 what was the reason? Obviously, I appreciate this, that the HQ is in Singapore, is in Asia Pac anyway, so that's that sort of region. But where was that thought process? Why, why not the rest of Africa? Or is that something that may come in the future? Yeah, well, you know, we, we're very passionate about Africa. We'd love to do more in Africa. And we have tried um, to do things in Africa. So we've seriously looked at Africa. Um, The way we think about the strategy of expansion is you want to expand to a market um, that is most suited to your model. So where the strengths of how you do business um, can play uh, to best advantage. And if you think about our model, as I've described it before, uh, Mm -hmm. what we really need when we go into a new market is we need a market with a progressive regulator that will allow us to do banking in the cloud and digital uh, KYC and onboarding. Um, you need a country with a digital KYC system. You yep. need a country with strong formalized retail where you can actually put these kiosks down in retail stores that can accommodate them and you can integrate into their checkout counters. And then you need a big population of young, um, digitally savvy people who will be open to doing banking in this new way. And we looked at the entire world, and outstandingly, the market that suited our model best was the Philippines, um, on, on, on every one of those um, characteristics. Um, uh, and, um, of course, the Philippines, double the size of South Africa, 100 million people, um, 70% of people in the Philippines have never had a bank account. Um, wow. But the Philippines is um, growing at 6%. Um, the highest social media uh, penetration in the world, uh, the highest gaming penetration in the world. Um, it, it's almost just, uh, you know, perfect for our model. So, so that was sort of the thought process that was behind uh, going into the market. And then, um, and then we were lucky enough that they then um, decided to issue uh, digital banking licenses, 
that um, had lower capital requirements than traditional banks. So we applied yeah. for one of those licenses. We, we, we found a partner in the Philippines, fantastic a partner by the name of the Gokongwe Group, um, the, the third la largest family conglomerate in the Philippines, largest retail group in the Philippines. Um, and um, yeah, we were lucky to get a great partner and to get a license. Um, and now, as they say, it's history. We, uh, we're almost at a million customers and growing roughly at twice the pace that we predicted in our forecasts. And I'm not going to say it was a cookie cutter approach, but a um, very similar model in terms of uh, the go-to-market, the product offering that you had in South Africa. Was it quite easy to sort of transpose that into the Philippines or, or the, what a bit of modification that needed to happen? You know, I think a big part of the success of taking a model from one market to the other is to figure out which parts are the same and which parts need mod modification. So you're mm -hmm. quite right. The model is the same. So it's kiosks, it's retail partnerships, uh, it's starting with transactions and savings as the core proposition with loyalty. So a lot is the same, but we actually use the Philippines as an opportunity to actually build let's call it version 2.0 of what we did in South Africa and right. learn from the mistakes, do it much better. And we ended up doing it uh, faster, uh, doing it better and doing it significantly cheaper than we did it the first round in South Africa. And, and talking about sort of uh, the, the expense of uh, launching into a new market, um, I think for any entrepreneur, it's, it's an expensive venture, uh, but, as a bank, I imagine it's probably, you know, multiple times of that. But, uh, you know, Time Bank raised a, a Series B, I think it was $70 million, um, beginning of this year, back end of last year, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what is that sort of capital being, being used for? Is it, is, it, is it other markets? Is it focusing on the South African market and the, the, Philippine, the Filipino market? What, how are you utilizing those funds? Yes, so um, we're very um, happy to say that South Africa doesn't need more money. So we've raised all the money we needed for South Africa to get South Africa to profitability. Uh, and we now have enough capital in South Africa to, to run the business. So the business is at a point where it's sort of generating the capital that it needs to keep going. So the new money that we're raising now, uh, all going uh, into the Philippines. And a bit of a, a news update, Darren, is that we've, uh, we've made the call not to go into Pakistan. And we're currently oh. far advanced in negotiations to go into Vietnam uh, as our third country. Um, oh, wow. uh, so Vietnam, also very interesting, also around 100 million people, 98% employment in the country, a young, uh, very uh, um, optimistic and young population. So we're quite excited about Vietnam potentially being our third market. Fantastic. Well, best of luck. I didn't, I didn't know that. So uh, uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Um, uh, especially if we, if we look um, sort of around the globe a little bit more and we come to South America, I think there's a lot of fintechs in Africa that are going, actually, the, the, you know, the, the demographics are quite, uh, quite similar. The, um, uh, you know, the challenges, the financial inclusion side. Um, do, do you see that in the future as, in sort of South America being a play for you guys or are you, are you quite happy to sort of Asia Pac and Africa? You know, um, so you're right. Um, so, so, you know, we, the other market that actually suits our model um, very well is, is Mexico, uh, which sort of Latin American uh, uh, market and other South American countries are, right. are potentially great countries to go into. And in fact, um, I would say the bank we admire most in the world uh, is New Bank in Brazil. And they started right. in Brazil, then went to Mexico and to Colombia. Um, and so, yes, I would say Africa, South America, Southeast Asia and South Asia, probably the areas in the world where these kinds of models are best suited. Um, interestingly, the reason I've been pushing back against South America and, and there have been opportunities from there that have come our way. Um, the reason I've been pushing back is sort of the time zone, time zone problem, uh, the, the stretch on the team. So currently the team sits in a sort of a nine hour time zone between the guys who are most west and most east. Um, and I think sort of that six to nine hours, if you want to stay sane in a fast growing business, 
is, is probably as much of a stress stretch as I feel up to at the moment. Um, maybe one day we grow up, then we sort of work around the globe, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, not there yet. No, so for me right now, on. you know, East Africa, North Africa, maybe even Eastern and Southern Europe and, uh, and Southeast Asia, it's probably just in terms of keeping, keeping, keeping things together um, and keeping our sanity. It's probably more where we will be looking at. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, kind of, it was it was interesting, right? So, I, I was I wasn't sure sort of how this conversation was going to sort of what angles we were going to take, and I, I was thinking about some of the other sort of challenger banks here, digital banks here in South Africa, some of the others in in Europe, you know, the Revoluts and the N26s and the Starling banks and what have you. Um, and I think they've all come from very different backgrounds so in, in terms of how they were formed, um, without. And, and this is not knocking any other of the banks that I've just mentioned or any others, but, um, you know, with a financial inclusion first mentality, um, which is, you know, how do we build a bank for everyone? And, you know, if um, if I, me as an individual, I, I want certain benefits or I want certain applications or I want everything bundled into one app, then fine, I've, I've got an option. Um, but for the, you know, the rest of the population, if they just need to get, that first sort of step on the ladder, um, they need to be able to, uh, you know, use a bank facility to help them grow their SME or micro business. Um, they need to be able to save in order to fund an education or a car or, or vehicle or whatever it may be. Um, you know, that that's kind of the mindset of Time Bank. I think that's uh, that's been very enlightening for me. Uh, I wasn't aware of that story. So uh, very enlightening. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, in terms of the future of banking in South Africa, let's just bring it back home for, for a moment. Um, where do you see that going? Um, and particularly if we look at the incumbent banks, where do you see them being in five, 10 years time? Um, Darren, that's a big conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a few thoughts and then you can sort of guide me as to what you think is interesting to go into more sure. deeply. You know, I think the first thing to say, uh, and and uh, and I do hear other people saying this: South Africa has formidable uh, banks. The quality of the banking industry, the quality of the banks, the quality of service uh, is streets ahead of many other places in the world, and even some of the most developed countries in the world. <clears throat> and it's interesting we see it comparing South Africa to the Philippines. In the Philippines, we've got many more competitors, but the competitors quite frankly, are not as good as the competitors in South Africa. Uh, and so, you know, the one thing I wouldn't do is sort of lightly bet against the incumbent banks and their ability to, to provide um, customers with a great um, service. Having said that, the, 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 the existing banks, the incumbent banks, have one enormous challenge, and that is a, a, what I would call a structural cost disadvantage. Um, so if you compare what we do in Time Bank, um, our cost per customer is less than a tenth of the cost per customer of the big banks. Mm. Now, that is a lot of money to give back to customers by way of savings, to give to investors and to give to um, partners to help us deepen uh, our access to banking. Um, and so, so... At some point, the incumbents are going to have to face this structural cost problem they have if they want to be serious about um, banking, let's call it the mass market, most South Africans, if they don't mm -hmm. just want to be in uh, investment, corporate, business, and, and, and let's say private banking. Um, the second is the, the scourge of, of, techno of, of um, technology legacy. Uh, you know, there's this um, Chinese, uh, uh, this, uh, this Irish story about a guy on a country road who, who stops and asks the Irish farmer, um, you know, he shows the place, I need to go here. How do I get to this place from here? And the farmer says, if I were you, I wouldn't start here. Um, <laughs> and now this is the problem with big banks is that the, the, the entire technology stack, the way in which the bank is built, 
does not provide you with a sensible path to yep. cutting the costs by 90 or 95 percent. You can maybe, if you really work hard, cost, cut the cost by five or 10 percent, but that's not the order of magnitude cost improvement that you that that you're looking for. Uh, and so I think that combination means that if if big banks are serious about competing with people like us, they're going to have to make a fresh start. They're going to have to actually start something on the side that looks completely different from what they're doing. Having said that, we know that there are some segments of customers who still love the branch, who still want that sort of safety or the security of the branch. And so they will be in the same way as there were people who still use checkbooks still until fairly recently. There yep. will be people, there will be a tail of people who will continue to prefer the incumbents uh, or the way in which banking works uh, through the incumbents. Very interesting. I, I, I recorded um, a podcast a few weeks ago with um, Diamond Trust Bank in Kenya. And despite them going on a, a huge digital transformation journey, they're opening another 500 branches. Right. Um, so digital transforming, but recognizing the fact that a lot of their customers in Kenya uh, and Tanzania, I think it is, um, you know, still want to go into the bank because that's where they are comfortable. That's where actually it's quite a social gathering as well. And they can't take that away because they will lose customers. So it, it's finding that balance. Um, but as, as a smaller bank in, in Diamond Trust Bank, I think it's slightly easier to do, albeit they've been around for 80 odd years. Um, if you look at some of the big banks here in South Africa, I mean, I, I drive past um, a building of one of the banks every day and that particular branch of or building of that branch is just for just for vehicle loans, right? And I go, what do all these people do? I mean, surely. <laughs> and this is just one building. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not for one minute suggesting that there needs to be a mass culling or, or mass retrenchments here, but, um, you know, with the, uh, you know, with technologies that are coming out, the advancements of AI, the advancements of machine learning, all of these other sort of topical uh, technologies that are coming out, I, I, I think, you know, there's going to be some reshaping, um, resizing at some point. And I think the, 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 the brave ones that do that sort of sooner will probably, uh, you know, still survive. I'm not saying the banks are going anywhere because they clearly have a, a big place in the economy and in financial services mm. sort of ecosystem. But I think, uh, yeah. you know, digitization is not just about technology. It's, uh, you know, cultural, it's, uh, you know, it's OPEX, it's everything, isn't it? So uh, interesting to see what yeah. happens, I think. You know, and it's about brand promise. So one of the reasons big banks can't get rid of branches is because that's the promise they gave. And it's very difficult to change that social contract with their customers to say, mm -hmm. you no longer have that. So, um, uh, and that's why pure digital players or digital banks like ours, who create, where we create a very specific kind of channel to do the work of the branch, we can do that because we never we never provided the brand promise of we'll give you a branch. We were clear from day one. If you come to us, you're not going to have that thing. And that works. I think it's extremely difficult once you've got the branch there, extremely difficult to take it away. Yeah, because I think if it's seen as the branch is closing down, um, that has negative, you know, that, that's, uh, that sort of forms negative thoughts about, you know, that bank and uh, the commitment to the community or wherever else it, it may be. So I get that. Um, could my very, very last question, and then I'm going to let you go and get on with your day of running a bank um, rather than talking to me, I promise. But um, how do you retain customers? And let me let me just unpack that a little bit, because, you know, it's so easy nowadays to open up a bank account. Right. Um, as you said, it takes three and a half minutes at a kiosk with with Time Bank. Um, I can open up another bank account on my phone. I can I can open up three or four bank accounts on my phone. Um, how do you ensure there's stickiness? Um, how do you ensure that you know your 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 customers stay within Time Bank and are you know and, and are lifelong? Because you've you've obviously spent even though it's a tenth of the cost of acquiring then um, you know the, the the incumbent banks, there's still a, a cost. You need to recover that cost to make sure that you know these people are, are still with you in X you know months years time. How do you do that? You know, one of the exciting things, uh, Darren, about the world in which we live is that customers have choice and they're able to, if they're not happy, they're able to move. So ultimately, yeah. you know, you're only as, as successful as you are popular with customers and customers have to love what you give them. 
Um, and so I think a lot of the key here is in the customer service area. But it's also in anticipating what the customer will want next. So, so we invest quite heavily into what we call our recommendation engine, which is essentially using AI um, and, 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 and customer behavioral patterns to understand what a customer needs today and what they're most likely to need next after they've done something. So in the same way as your natural language models simply protects, predicts the next, next best word to put in the sentence, um, our recommendation engine simply predicts the next best thing that you're most likely to want to learn or most likely to want to do. And it is a question of building the thing for you that you're most likely to want next and making sure that the experience of using that is an empowering experience. And if you get that right, your customers just use you more and more. They might start by only using you as a savings account or to send money to their family uh, or to put a bit of money aside for that their spouse can't see or whatever the case may be. And then the trick is just to keep in that relationship, keep nudging the customer to say, what about this? You know, and, and nudge them to do the right thing at exactly the right time that works for them. And in this way, you know, when we started, our customers did on average, maybe two and a half or three things with us a month. Now our average customer does 11 things with us a month. Wow. And, and that will just keep growing. Amazing. I, I, I guess ultimately, though, because you're a bank and you're not necessarily a fintech, um, it's, it's about trust, right? It's about trust. People need to trust the bank. They need to trust their bank, um, which is why I think a lot of people stick with, you know, who they're, family who, who their mother and father bank with who their grandparents bank with certainly here in south africa and so on and so forth um you know i think building trust is is so so critical because you know we look in in, in the other side of the of the world or not the world but the other side of the market and we look at the world of crypto and we've seen ftx and we've seen this one and we've seen that one and we've seen all this you know um and it's just made people shudder uh, because there's no trust now in in that sort of part of the market um you know if, if, is there a strategy to retain or re not even regain, because I don't think you've ever lost trust, but um, to build trust in something that, you know, a consumer can't walk into a branch and go to the branch manager and say, hey, listen, where's my money? Um, is, 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 is that, again, a cultural shift? Is, is that about education? Or how does that work? Yeah, <clears throat> trust is at the heart of it. Um, a trust is, is hard won and easily lost. And so... You know, I think for us, um, we know that that we're still in the process of building trust. We know it's a long-term game. Uh, you always have to be, you know, at the top of your game, never le let customers down. Um, and so, you know, consistent high performance is key to trust. Um uh, being associated with other trusted brands, we when we go into a new market, we make sure we associate with retailers that are very trusted, other brands that are very trusted, loyalty programs that are trusted. So you 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 trust a new brands based on the other brands they hang out with. That plays a role. Um, uh, but ultimately, the only way to be trusted is to be very deeply trustworthy. So we invest very heavily in making sure that our compliance processes, our risk management, the way in which we help customers deal with things like fraud and so on, uh, you know, is best of breed. And it's just an ongoing uh, commitment to day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day improvement uh, to be worthy of customers' trust. Uh, but the nice thing is that trust and great customer experience go well together because as long as you have a great experience with a brand, you're likely to also deepen your trust as you go. You absolutely are. Good. Thank you very, very much. I am going to let you go back to running a bank now. Uh, I, I, I might go and dip my toes in the sea before I drive back eight hours to Joburg tomorrow. So uh, I, I've really, really enjoyed this chat. Thank you so very, very much. Um, uh, if, if people don't sort of uh, know where to find you, I guess, sort of look you up on LinkedIn. Um, I know you're quite active on there. Um, you know, have a look at Time Bank. We'll post some links, uh, you know, at the bottom. If you're listening on Spotify, you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put the links there. If you're on YouTube, the sort of 
down here somewhere. So uh, feel free to to click around. Um, uh, thank you again very, very much. Thank you to your team as well for facilitating this. And uh, good luck in the Vietnam. Thank you, Darren. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Talking Success. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for this fascinating discussion on all things fintech. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and have gained some valuable insights into the ever-evolving world of finance and technology. A huge thank you to our guests for sharing their expertise and providing us with some amazing insights that we certainly couldn't have done this without them. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and stay tuned for more exciting conversations with experts in the field. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep talking success.